just going to say and uh, here welcome everybody uh, Silvia Mayo Silvia Laudin Mayo and we have our star Tim Kent welcome to our first artist session I'm so excited and off we go Silvia uh, take it away let's have a few questions and answers with uh, Tim all right Yes, welcome everybody. We're excited having this interview with our famous Tim Kent today. He's in his studio, everybody socially distancing in their spaces. But I got to see this amazing new work in his gallery and it's really something to see. So we're going to discuss some of his older works and then move into the gallery space with the new works. Tim, you're in New York now or Brooklyn, which is really the navel of the world, right? Grown, you grew up in Canada, lived on the, the other coast, right, um, from Vancouver, the northwest coast of America, but then spent quite some time in our beloved Europe in England, right, west to the West Dean College in East Sussex. Now here, do you still feel like this is the center of the artwork right now, world, right now here in New York City, the place to be for you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh it has been it has been the center of their art world, and in the last twenty years, it's kind of exploded. Um, yeah. at, at one point, there was sort of several. Well, there are a few places to go. London was getting big, and I think Berlin was getting really big. Yes. Uh, and then, for some reason, the, the the scenes cooled off there, but they kept growing here. And so, this is a place to be. I think if you're if you're going to try and uh, be in this in this kind of manic business, yeah. yes. Yes, I agree. Gunther and I agree, right? We love, we love this place here and uh, the creative spirit is just amazing in New York. So here we have this whole list also of your solo exhibitions and you're showing a lot here in New York, but you've also shown in, um, in Europe, in the United, you know, in UK, Switzerland, Germany, the Netherlands. And I'm always intrigued, like thinking, how is that different? Like you travel with your shows, you show your work. You know, in, in Europe, is that different? Like you see your, your works hanging there. Do people react to it differently? What changes, like the vibe? Do they connect with different? different yeah, I mean, I think, I think one of the things about having done my undergraduate degree in the U.S. at Hunter College in New York, it, it was mainly conceptual work was the, was the base of what we were trying to study at the time. So it was things like painting weren't so important. And you know, painting had kind of fallen out of fashion. But going to going to Europe, there's a long tradition of painting that hasn't been kind of eradicated by the, the ultra-modern movements, right, the new material movements. Uh, and I think yeah. that kind of gave me a sense of security in approaching the work and staying with the work rather than sort of beginning to experiment in other mediums. And the other thing was, you know, every time I go to Europe, I'm surprised by how the audiences are positively responding to the work. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pleasant surprise. Whereas in the US, it took a lot longer to sort of get a foothold because people didn't want to see this sort of stuff. 10 years ago, people didn't want to see sort of uh, see painting. But now you see all these artists who are going back into it. And yeah. you see them working in, in painting and, and two dimensional media. And, you know, not necessarily painting, but I think things like um, different sort of. Uh, uh, collage media uh, mediums and two dimensional medium in general, especially with the digital screens coming out and photography is making a resurgence as a fine art, especially with film photography. So yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I think showing in Europe has been, has been a real experience, a good experience. I have a, I have a quick question too. How going back, how, what made you decide to go from New York to West Dean in Sussex to get your masters in fine art? Um, we, I want to know that bridge. When I when I left, when I graduated from university, I started painting pictures about the city, sort of doing these small landscapes. And the city, I was living in Brooklyn at the time, and I went out to see some relatives of mine, and they had mentioned that around probably about ten miles from their house, there was a there was a master's program for painting, which wasn't which was a small program. And so I went to look at this, this program and it was in the most idyllic, bucolic landscape. Uh, and it was the farthest thing from Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. and, and I was just like, this place is amazing. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna apply for it. And I applied for it and it was a very small program. 
And it was very craft-based programs. It was all about sort of practi practical application, not only the theoretical ideas that underpinned the work. And so that's how I ended up going there. Uh -huh. and, 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 it's, and the, the cost of the, of the program was about a fifth of the U.S. programs. And I think for a, probably a better education. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And this yeah, is how, how you then uh, sneaked your way into some of these amazing old mansions. Yeah. Where we still see some inspirations today in your work. Yeah. So I was, you know, at that time I, I had finished the master's program and with another artist, we began looking for a place to exhibit the works we had been doing. And the works we had been doing were not that great. But the woman who ended up lending us her barn was a writer for the arts newspaper. And she saw my sort of interior works that I was beginning to develop while I was at, at Westin College. And she suggested that I go talk to some of her friends. And some of her friends had these old stately homes that they were kind of like trying to keep going. And so that was how I got into yeah. these houses. The first, and once you start getting into sort of like the stately home world, Right, right, you know, yeah. the door starts, the enfilade starts opening. <laughs> yes, you see that the, in your recent show, right? Yes. Yeah, so this is, you know, so as these doors started opening, I was like, okay, I'm, and the, the houses kept getting more and more grandiose and uh, spectacular. And of course, coming from Brooklyn, it was a, it's a complete privilege and it's also mind blowing because all of a sudden you're surrounded with hot, the, the best of the high Baroque, the best of, uh, um, the Edwardian, the best of the Georgian period. I mean, it's just, it was insane. So I could go into these places and see, see the artifacts. And I had all these ideas and I also knew how to handle the, I also knew how to handle the spaces I was, I was looking at. And so I could think about ways of comp composing pictures using the photo references I was making, but also a lot of rigorous drawing that would go into them later. And that's how I think I got, that's how I think I, I managed to make those earlier works really successful. So, right. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Cool. So these are some more. So here the, the group exhibitions mm -hmm. uh, for everybody to have on file. And uh, here is the um, first show with Slack Gallery in 2015. Yeah, so now you have your work hanging, works hanging right in the middle of Chelsea in these amazing buildings. And, you know, Gunther and I visit you a couple of, you know, regularly in your studio in, in Brooklyn, which is you know, small, there's no window. It really, you know, it's like this very personal place. We we'll see another picture later on with your cat there and you spend, you know, real thinking and working time. They're like, how, how do these uh, paintings, how, are, how do they breathe different, differently to you? Like, is that important to you? Where are they hanging? Where are they seen? Do you think about like, where are they going to end up? Like, do you, to them, they must be like babies that are alive somehow. Do you think about like, what would be a great place for them to find their home and to live, you know, or to... Well, obviously they should hang in the Louvre, but that's probably not yeah, going to happen. I, know. Exactly. I, I was writing the right. question, I was thinking that too, yeah. <laughs> but I, but I, I think like, I think part of the, you know, again, like as you mentioned, the studio has no windows in it and it's, it's all the light is artificial. And, you know, I have venting systems to help carry out the, the fumes, but I, I deliberately decided not to have windows so I wouldn't get too much influence from what was happening outside. Um, and as the works begin building, as you kind of, as I begin building a show, the works begin to talk to each other. So they begin, little parts of them relate to each other. So in this, in the two pieces that you selected here, which is the strange attractor and somnambulist, this idea of the sort of round shape, you know, whether it's coming out in the somnambulist, it's kind of coming towards the camera. And where in the stranger tracker, it's kind of moving away from the camera. The technique is the same in both of them. So both of these paintings are beginning to inform each other on how they get built. And one thing I've learned in my painting career is that I don't think I've ever finished a painting. I think what happens is I, I'm very process oriented. So I want to constantly build a layer, create a layer, wipe out a layer, uh, or change what's happening on the surface all the time. And the moment it's done, is the moment it leaves the studio. So in this case, all these pieces get made and then they go to the gallery and then they get put on the wall and now they're no longer sort of in this chaos of the space that I, that I live in yeah. and I work in. And, and I get to see them for the first time 
once they hit the walls of the gallery. And so when they hit the walls of the gallery, I can actually begin to assess what I've done with the painting or what the painting is doing. Before then, it's literally, the paintings are sort of places where I organize the mess of my studio. And then I can, and then when it's left, it's now existing in its own right. And basically I just have a really messy studio left over. <laughs> so do you ever find yourself then going back on the, um, back to the painting once it's in the gallery and, and changing a little bit of something still where you see, oh, you know, something now I noticed. <laughs> there, no. No. <laughs> once once yes, you let go, yes. you let go, right? Oh, no, yes. Nice of, the house. of course, yes. I, I we let it go. back to the gallery and touched up the work. Yeah, yeah. I, and, I definitely um, spent, I spent a couple, I think Arena, I, I, I've driven uh, Arena, uh, my gallerist, crazy by kind of coming in the morning of the show and like retouching something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yes, you definitely have a strong mind on your side, yes. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So where do these spaces come from, actually? That is something that would be interesting to me also. You say, like, process is super important to you, of course, right? But, like, for us who are not artists, like, where does that, where, where do you start even with these spaces? Where do they come from? Do they live, like, you know, okay. in your memory? Do they come up in your dreams? Do they come, do they, do you construct them in your mind? Or where does it? You know, well, I, I, I like, I mean, I, I think uh, that question is really good, especially with regards to this painting, Five Minute Warning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I think what, uh, what it shows, I really start from an abstract composition. And so in this painting, you have this sort of large shape happening at the uh, bottom, this sort of like, a, almost like a, I guess, a pyramid shape. And then you got this red shape. And then you got this sort of mountainous shape happening at the top. And these are all abstract patterns. And once I kind of get something that is exciting for me in terms of my eye, in terms of the abstraction of the canvas uh, or the design of the canvas, then I can begin building into it with putting space in or taking space out. And so in this painting in particular, you kind of have three or four different spaces happening simultaneously. You have this sort of strange uh, electrical thing happening at the bottom of the painting. And then you have this sort of uh, industrial grids layer with these sort of red lines. Yes. And then you have this, this idea of people, what I th think about people traveling in some sort of uh, either an airplane or a train. So they have their own space and, and that has its own logic. And then you have this sort of like, and it's imposed upon this sort of strange um, Bruegel background. Right. And so I'm yeah. trying to just, I try and add into the abstraction some sort of narrative layer. And I don't want it to look, I don't want, I, I want all my spaces to be somewhat recognizable, but at the same time, I don't want them to be exact. So mm -hmm. I want them to sort of give an idea of something. And again, I think that sort of, Bru that Bruegel back, or that Leonardo type background is an example of sort of the imposition of a classical system on top of a, a very modern design, I think. Yes. To, me, to me, something yes. like this is just stunning. I, I, I have found no other word, but stunning, I really do. Thank you. I'm intrigued also by the um, by your titles here. You you mentioned narrative because that's also always you know like a question you ask yourself. You see something that's quite there's a lot of abstract layers, and you definitely see how here you know the the space and the architecture is important. Wait, Gunther, could you go back just to the five minute warning? That was like a <clears throat> thank you because that is quite a, a very specific title, right? That makes it even if you just if you look at the painting and, and um, enjoy the abstraction and, you know, like the looseness of the suggestions, then five minute warnings, that's pretty concrete. And then you wonder like, what's going on here? What's, you know, then there's like something there, there's tension. That's another layer sort of, right? right? Yeah, I think this, this particular piece, it, it's a, I think it was a five, it was, I think the song's called Five Second Warning. Uh, it was a song by Radiohead and basically, it has this very, very strange, somber, atmospheric quality to the sound of the song. Uh -huh. And as I was making the piece, I was like, you know, this, the feeling that I'm getting from the song really relates to this, this painting. And then as I began putting the figures into it, I began to think about it. There was an emergency. There was some sort of urgency that was happening here. And I wanted to give that, I wanted to give the piece a, a title that expressed the urgency of an event. Yeah. And so I ended up with the five-minute warning because it's it's an odd amount of time, isn't it? You have five minutes 
there's a five minute warning of something <laughs> and that sort that that, that precedes some sort of terrible event and again i think you know i'm not a very positive i don't have a lot of hope in the future uh because i think we're kind of living at the cusp of the end of a of a cycle of a, of something and so most of my work does tend to have a T I tend to title the work after something that is not that is giving some sort of pre idea of a failure. Yeah. Does that make sense? It makes, sense. It makes total sense. Yes, and yeah. you definitely get that mood from from it. Yeah. From some sort of foreshadowing, I think. Is yeah. 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 Okay. Well, yeah, scared now. You started. You you uh, you are a musician as well, right? You played in a band, and so music must be you know something that that's with you always, right? That you think of in uh, in terms of rhythm or mood or in musical terms when you paint. Well, I, I mean, I do think I do think um, I do get a fair amount of visual uh, visual ideas from listening to different types of music. Yeah. Um, and I think that. In this case, I mean, I, rarely do I name something after uh, after a piece of music, but in this case, this was this was one of these works, um, and but I do get visualized. I do visualize when I listen to music, without a doubt, and I do get I, compositional ideas when I when I'm listening to music, yeah. and it can be any kind of music. It, it just it has to be the right mood, and if something connects, then I'll definitely start mm -hmm. seeing something like it's, like it's, it's, like Kandinsky, and, and in fact, he's when I was a very young artist, I was reading Kandinsky, a lot of Kandinsky. Yeah. And Point in Line to Plane is probably one of the more influential texts in my uh, that I've read. Uh -huh. It really made sense to me because all of a sudden, the sound that he's talking about. What and I ask, and I have students today that I ask, you know, can you describe this 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 symbol that I'm making as a noise? So, and that's a great, it's a great exercise because if you can begin sort of visualizing sound, yes. then you're making sort of like, you're making that abstract connection that needs to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. That's why it's convincing. Right. Yeah. Um, Kamal is this next uh, painting that you, um, that we're looking at. And um, I love like this balance. There's always like a balance or a, uh, tension between different elements in your in your work there's definitely here the structure like the ge like these geometric um architectural structures that are part of most of your works but then there is also here um that it seems to kind of intrude in the landscape here like if you envision like a, this gorgeous landscape with mountains and maybe a valley but then it's as if the structure is really like um built into it and destroying this beautiful landscape but it still kind of survives. And then in the lower parts, there's also these beautiful painterly passages, these very organic and colorful passages that seem to kind of fight back and uh, which, I fi which I find in intriguing. <laughs> and, oh, you're standing right there. Yeah, yeah. It's right there, exactly. There you go, yes. Yeah, yeah actually, I, I don't own this painting. It's a, it, but it lives here. Uh, the person who, who, who owns the painting has left it here uh-huh okay it's on loan can get a house that's big enough to fit the painting that's so been living oh. here <laughs> i did want to pause for a while i love the light here we're not really sure where does the light come from right there is a, it's such an intimate quiet beautifully lit interior so um yeah do you uh, and the and the figure here we're not really sure she could be this could be one of your fancy interiors in the south of england right or is it more invented? Like what brought you to this interior here? I think the first thing was that this painting really worked accidentally because I, I remember all of a sudden the color beginning to do what it needs to do by itself. Right? The color began to kind of emerge out of this, this glaze, these glazes that I was putting onto it. And that sort of greeny gold, I remember when it, it the green gold violet in the background, I remember when it started, when it started coming together I was like, this can be a very, very simple painting, and it just needs a, a little element of movement somehow. And a few years ago, I had a lady model for me in, in this fantastic dress gown that she had bought, and uh, I was like, I can imagine her being in this space somehow. And so yeah. I took this idea of her moving through this space, and this dress kind of, this chiffon dress kind of moving in that space. And that's kind of where that painting 
developed from. And I wanted it to be just a simple interior and have an idea of movement to it. And it turned out really well. It was very simple. And it also helped me simplify my ideas slightly. And so this is something that as I develop the show that I just opened at uh, Amphalade, um, this is kind of really one of the pieces that inspired what was, what was going to come later. Yeah, for sure. But it took, I mean, it took yeah. f- four years to get there. You know? Yeah. I love again, the so, layer yeah. of the title, right? That's so loose, but it's very powerful. Like you look at this painting yeah. um, with the title and you can come up with like a whole movie around it. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. 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 I, I agree. I think, I think everything, I'm really happy you selected this piece because everything about it works, I think. And I'm, I'm, I like this piece very much. Cool. cool. All right. Yeah. Gunter is showing us here three images from your exhibitions in Germany. So you showed your work uh, 2017 in Fernheim, in Waldorf. And um, what was it like for you to be in Germany? I could see that, uh, you know, that there's a lot of connection. Well, how did it, what impressed you most about showing their traveling through our country? Hmm. Well, I, I mean, I think, first off, I really, really like the German people. Uh, and I found them very warm and I found them very um, accepting of what we were doing. Um, I found the people that supported the arts were enthusiastic about having us come in and do something. Um, And I also found that I found the country to be intriguing because you have places that were severely damaged and it's, they were rebuilt again. And you know, this is a very, very powerful uh, nation that really put itself together again. And I think that was, that's something I, I admire a lot. I think also the way in which you have this, it is kind of like the central grid of Europe of power distribution. So you have all these sort of electrical uh, systems running through, uh, running across the landscape, which at the time I was so into. Because they, you have these sort of these symbols of of um, of the modern world as it is, and its reliance on electricity, and you have this landscape that is kind of integrated into the electrical grid. And uh, I, I think I was driving from yeah. No, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I think I was driving back. I was in um, Saarbrück, mm-hmm. and no. I was driving back to um, Frankfurt, and I remember coming over the hill this big hill, this mountainside, and it was early, early morning, and you saw these sort of golden electrical wires everywhere. And I thought, yeah. that is a beautiful image. Like, that is an incredible image. And it's something I, I, I think it's something I actually add in my paintings now, oh, as yeah. I'm doing sort of the drawing, the, the line drawing that I do in, in my later work. So yeah. yeah, I think that, that definitely impressed me. My question was going to be, is that where the pylons first came to your attention when you drove through Germany or have you had your obsession with them? No, it, it's, they keep that, showing up? no, that was when I, 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 I started thinking about the pylons earlier. Okay. Uh, but it, if you are a pylon fetishist, the way I am, mm-hmm. uh, then you will find that every single generation of pylon is accessible. I, I took so many photographs of pylons when I drive across Germany. Okay. Here, the Hearst Building, named after the founder, William Randolph Hearst, the world's largest publishing company in the 1920s. Still today, the Hearst Corporation produces a dozen plus magazines like Cosmopolitan, El Decor, Harper's Bazaar, The O Magazine, Oprah Winfrey. They're also part owners of A&E, the Arts and Entertainment Network, and ESPN TV. They employ about 20,000 people with revenues of about $12 billion in 2019. The building was designed by British architect Lord Norman Foster. In 2003, it was the first environmentally friendly building with a platinum rating by LEED, the Green Building Council of America. Every year, the Hearst highlights works by artists through their art program, Art Now. Out of thousands of applicants, roughly 30 artists get chosen to exhibit their work for six months on the second floor at the village square in their building. 
Tim Kent has been chosen twice, in 2017 and in 2019, where the theme of it was metamorphosis, climate change. This is an amazing Congrats. painting, the Tagebau. Yes, even without... 2017, with and this was the one chosen for the 2019 show at, uh, at the Hearst Tower, Isotopia. Yeah, this definitely stands out for the color, right? Like what inspired you here? Is that music too that brought in the yellow? <laughs> well, it was, it, it, this painting, the color is really intense. I mean, this is a yeah. very large painting. I mean, it's uh, nearly 10 foot by 10 foot, I think. Um, or eight, nine feet by nine feet. But I think what happened, what I tried to do is express the idea of things we can't see around us so sort of like electro, uh, electromagnetic uh, waves or um, any sort of communication waves or even just you know radiation waves anything that we we've made and is in the environment now and i wanted to try and get that an idea of that invisibility um to be expressed and i, I thought i'd try and pick the most bright minerally color i could I could, and I chose this with yellow. And it kind of took over, but one thing I do like about this particular painting is the way the yellow vibrates. And you can't really tell if it's sitting on the front or if it's in the background. And that's kind of what I was going for. And so I thought about this sort of, almost sort of um, futuristic landscape with these very, very, intense colors you know, no trees just air full of some sort of electrical impulse mm -hmm. and that's that's where this painting kind of stemmed from and i think i put a couple characters in the a couple little characters in the uh, middle right corner just to give it a little bit of a a little bruegel story yes you know, always i always like to use sort of bruegel as an example of how to get little characters doing funny little things in yeah. these paintings all the way in the far back, it seems like a very peaceful uh, landscape, actually. Yeah, it, 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 to me, it began to look a bit like Las Vegas. Uh -huh. So, you see peaceful landscape, I see Las Vegas. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't be peaceful. All right. <laughs> now, here, this, this is the first painting we're looking at where the, the figures are really very close up to us, right? Like, very uh, corporately dressed up. Uh, figures here caught in this web of, uh, or this structural web. Um, you said in previous interviews also that you were interested in like power structures and the political system you just set yourself, right? What are these order types here? What were you, you know, what are they about? These order okay, so, you know, the, the, the term order types is, is a market term, is stock market term. Obviously you, you place an order, you, you make, you put money into the market. So that's an, the different types of orders that are going into the market. The other thing is it's a pun or, or it's a play on the word order types. And here you have the sort of presidential um, signing of, I think this was the Tax Repeal Act of 1984. And you have all these sort of presidential characters clapping the president for putting this uh, or applauding the president for putting the, um, for putting the law into, uh, for putting the order into law. And so, but they all have their place in, the, in this sort of hierarchy of relationship to the president. And so each one of these characters is closer and they're all smiling, but they're actually not smiling. And are they really clapping for this guy or can they, they really want to get rid of this guy? So there's this relationship. There's a play on, on the word order there. And then of course, I put it into such a tight geometric structure. So I've ordered it. I've ordered this thing as well. And uh, the last thing was kind of thinking about the way in which we perceive imagery. And we don't really perceive imagery as what we experience immediately. We all have these sort of, our brain makes ideas of what we see. And our brain is, what we see in terms of digital content, what we see in terms of uh, flat magazine content, what we see in terms of real content. I think there's a, uh, there's a, there's a disconnect in our heads about how we see these things, but we simply just accept them as part of our reality. And so now we have all these different types of mediums uh, or media that are, we exist with simultaneously. 
And so part of this grid system with these figures moving into this space and dissolving is what I was trying to express. Yeah. Is that, is that fairly clear? Yeah. Did I, yes, did I have any questions? It makes, okay. uh, makes sense. Yeah. So you used here actually like a, a specific photograph. Do you find them? Um, you just pull them out of the media uh, photographs that are interesting to you or? I, I try, I try to use imagery from public archives. Okay. If I, if I'm looking for types of imagery, either I, I do my own photography or I do my own drawing or my own design, or I try and find things that are specifically in the, in the public archive, because I think it's interesting what nations decide to keep for their public records. It's very, yeah, it's very selective and very interesting. Yeah. And yeah. so you can get a certain amount of imagery and you might not get the imagery you want, but you get something that that'll be representative of a time and a place or an ideology. Yes. Yes. The WPA uh, times are very interesting that way. They kept everything, right? There's Absolutely. A security administration. There's a, a huge wealth of photos from that time. Absolutely. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, this is um, Gunther's backdrop now, this is my right? Background. Exactly. Yeah. Backdrop. Obviously, I love it. Yeah. Yes. Sure. This is part yeah. of the show, the 2018 show, um, Dark Pools and Data Lakes at Slack Gallery. Yes, it looks like the it, very similar grouping of figures, but they're harder to detect here, like in the five minute warning, right? Like again, like a group of people mm -hmm. somehow hovering there in this in the center, in the center right, yeah. together. And then, um, I don't know, you can take it different ways. Maybe in the background, my association would be with the corporate building and maybe the moon in the back there. But then um, you're calling it dark pools and data lake. To me, it looks also again like... You know, like the darkness is more for me in the in the sky where the lake actually looks pretty light and almost like a sky, like it, and it is infinitely infinite in in terms of space. It's very complicated, very complex, interesting um, um, painting. And then data lakes. So you're thinking about we talked about just before the digital world. Like, is that something to you that creates order, or something that rather makes us look, lose our footing? Like this wealth of you know, information that we that we live with right now, or maybe. You well, I mean, I think it's 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 a confusing time because we're no. Yeah. I think we are legitimately on the cusp of a whole new world structure. I think we're, and it's, and it's one that is about large organizations having all the information that we don't even know we are giving them in which it just goes into this, these large sort of uh, dark pools, right? Or these data lakes, sorry. And, and they kind of, there's just information about us that can be bought by anybody. Yeah. And so uh, in my, in my, in my painting, I've always borrowed from earlier paintings when I've kind of created a, su a successful language system. So as, as you pointed out, the figures in this one look like they come from five minutes morning, right? And in fact, they are, because it was such a, for me, it was such a successful way of expressing a certain idea that I could use it again in this one. And so there's sort of an icon, there's sort of an iconography that I begin to develop and then use in the works. Um, and again, I wanted the, I liked your interpretation of this sort of background being some sort of corporation, I think you said. Mm -hmm. uh, and what... To me, it is a it is a corporation. It's an organized entity of something that happens in the background, and then you have this corporation of bodies in the foreground, and then you have all these connections that are running up to them, as they're kind of dropping their information into this large electrical lake. Right. So the whole lake is 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 electrified, and then you have this idea of it being sort of extra planetary with this this strange moon in the background, and. Uh, and one thing I wanted to do with this painting was play up the falsity of the surface or the plastic surface so that what looks like a rock, move, a red rock moving into the water is actually just a sort of scar of paint and making sure that the whole surface is, it, the, everything that you see undoes itself as you look at it. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's why one reason why I think this painting is successful because it never really resolves into anything permanent. Uh, 
and again, when I was putting this together, if you, could, if you look at the bottom left-hand corner, there are these two little figures. And I liked the idea of the lake of, um, it wasn't the lake of fire. It's the damned, it's the damned, I think, from, um, from the inferno where they can never be in, they're in purgatory. They can never go between heaven and hell. And so you have this Rubens painting with all these figures being thrown up to the sky and being tossed back down again. Mm -hmm. And on the side, you know, I think the artist was Gustave Doré, and he's got these little figures of Virgil and Dante sitting by the lakeside. And I thought that would be a kind of be fun to put them in there as well, just making reference to an earlier idea of how we thought about how we thought about things that we couldn't see. So yeah. that's why those little characters are in there. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Mm -hmm. Is this that okay? Our Yes, it's very impressive. Very makes all makes very much sense. Yeah, cool. Okay. I love I love this. How you're um, here starting to play like with your you know with your babies with your paintings and kind of placing them within you know not only referencing them in in terms of like iconography but actually you know including your paintings here in this interior again. It reminds me maybe is it one of the places that you visited in the south of. England, it looks like a very stately interior, but um, it's a lot yeah, of the, the, here, the yeah. grouping is around like more like, um, you know, like a corporate setting maybe again in the center. Tell us about the idea here. We're wondering about the story. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, you know, one of the nice things about making painting is I might have my own idea about the work and then all of a sudden, especially with sort of narrative painting or this sort of like vaguely narrative painting, I have a story, and oftentimes it's not the same story that other people see. But I do think there are certain elements in this that I mean I, I, I use again. This this particular room, I have I have a photograph of it, and I've used it so many times, mm -hmm. just because it's it's like the gift that keeps on giving. Every time I look at this space, I get an idea for something else. It's a it was an empty room. Yeah, and I. I can always fill it with things that there's always stories I want to tell. So I can always tell another story. And this one had this sort of weird, I, I couldn't tell if they were making a prayer or if they were doing some sort of seance, if they were awaiting someone coming in the room or if someone had just come in the room. So everyone's standing up. Um, I couldn't really tell, but there was this weird thing that was happening between these figures. Uh, and again, yeah, you're right. There was the, I started placing my own paintings in these, in these spaces. And maybe this goes back to your first question. It's like, where do I see my paintings? Being? Well, I kind of actually see it. Okay. We lost you for a second here, and now we still don't know where you see them. <laughs> okay. Okay. Can you, is my connection so bad? It, it, sometimes it goes a little in and out. Yeah. Uh, okay. 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 Is it, uh, yeah. Do I ha do we have it now? Yeah. Yes, we can hear okay, you. Okay, so now. where 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 do you want me? Do you want me just to repeat what I just said? Yes. Okay. Where do you, yeah about having your own paintings in that space, including them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, again, like you, you were asking me, where do I see my paintings going? And I, and I jokingly said at the Louvre, but actually, I think about. I, I like the idea that when I'm on the internet, for example, there are these images that appear out of nowhere, and I see them as sort of a layered a layered world of image upon image upon image upon image. And so I actually sometimes think I make my paintings to be characters in other paintings. Yeah. And so you get this sort of like, you get this sort of meta layering of paintings per painting. Yes. And I did that in the last show in the, in the latest show. Uh, one of the pieces I replaced in the show, I actually painted it into the new painting that, that replaced it. Yeah. So we have Very one intriguing. more. Mm -hmm. We have sorry, we have one more painting before we go to the current show, and here's the directorate. Yeah, the directorate. I I've, I thought this is also very like spatially. Also, the figure and the space is in, intriguing because you really you know you can you, you look at it and they, you have again that um pa that structure that you very often the spatial structure, and it looks maybe as if it is going back, like as if it is an unfilad, right? Like a very deep space, but you can Perfect. also think of it coming up. Is it maybe, it makes me think of maybe film stills, like something, because I know you love film as well. Probably. Also like uh, a deck of cards that you flip and you got like these figures there. 
And then you look at the two figures, first immediate reaction would be like a bridal party because of that white. But then if you look closer, it's definitely two men dressed in, you know, in suit and tie as well. So you could read it so many different ways. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think I'm really, I think you interpreted the background correctly. And I think the, again, this idea of layering of images in space, right? In this sort of space time we live in, right? And that is exactly what I'm trying to get, convey there. And so one of the nice things about playing with this sort of ge geometry, this sort of simple perspective, which is, I mean, this old, old tool, is it allows sort of a very modern interpretation of when we look at it. And if we kind of, if, if one keeps an ambiguous background like this one is, it's easy to begin thinking of sort of film frames. And it's easy to begin thinking of sort of like a recession of like a moment of time. And I think that's really what that does to this painting. So I think you, you nailed that. Um, and then the figures themselves, I mean, they're just, to me, they're just very, very, oh, I don't really know about those figures. <laughs> I have a lot, I have a lot of strange, because this was a life-size painting. And so these paintings, these, uh, did you ever come to the studio when I was making this painting? Um, I remember the previous one. I'm not so sure about that one. This was, I mean, this is life-size. So, I mean, these figures are six foot five. Uh, and you know, these are big figures. And so they yeah. did give this sort of imposing impression to anyone that looked at them. Um, and, and it's, and the, the colors were, they were schismatic, you know, they kind of broke away from each other. And this was painted at the time of the election. So people would come into the studio with very, very clear ideas of what this was. Right. And, uh, and, and it began to take on this sort of political dimension to it. And I, it, this painting is now up in Chicago at the uh, 21st Century Museum, Hotel, Hotel Museum. And it's part of a show. I can't remember the, show, the title of the group show, but it's on now. And it, all, it has to do with sort of power and political power. Yeah. So this piece is actually, will always be associated with that idea, yeah. um, I think. Yes, I can see that too. Now that, yes, especially also this gesture, this pointed gesture, there's something very... Uh, um, very powerful about that person, you know, on the left figure. Yep. Mm. That hook in there, it looks very evil. Yes. <laughs> the what does? The, the, the hook in the middle, the sort of an, a hand, a finger oh, yeah. in the middle, it seems, above the white suit. Yeah, it's strikes creepy. It's very evil. Maybe anyway. he's tickling him, I don't know. <laughs> 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 okay, shall we move on? And yeah, that now come into the current gallery. show at the Slack Gallery. Okay, yes. it is. Here's the first painting. Odds are. Odds are, yes. Yeah. So now we have images, several images, actually, also close-ups of these uh, of of your work, of your work. So here, yes, I love this. Also, I have to say, I um, you know, here in New York City, we had the Gerhard Richter exhibition that only was up for three weeks, right? Gone. So for a lot of our German audience, I think that might be a painter on, you know, on people's radar because he's so much shown. And this very much reminded me of it. It's more, mostly to, more tangible than in other of your works that you're working off a photograph, right? Uh, and also it seems like a little bit from the, uh, from the past, but then you're going back on it. Like if Günther can go back, like here you see very clearly the photograph. Oh no, yeah, oh, here it's cut off, the, that's a detail of it, right? In the finished yeah. version, you, you, see, you here? Do okay. see the head here, right? We do see that the head, but you see how you work backwards from that, uh, from this photograph. And then, so when, and you're toying, of course, you're adding these, you're adding these figures and um, it becomes very intriguing. Like, who is this man, right? Is he an architect is he an urban planner is he a politician you know what is he doing with these people here uh standing in line it's ominous yeah yeah the, the i mean this whole show was painted uh during the 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 main the, the majority of the work was done during the beginning of the uh, lockdown for the pandemic so i was really informed by my own sort of anxiety of what was going on around us yes um, and initially I had started these paintings with a very vague idea of what direction they wanted to go into. But as the pandemic kind of took over and, and things beca became more and more, um, you know, uh, dystopic by, by day by day, mm. 
I began to kind of think about what sort of things are happening now that I could talk about without having to make a direct connection to this pandemic as being the one, one big event, right? And part of it was this idea of um, just statistics, because everything became about statistics. And, yeah. you know, one out of 10 people get this thing. One out of 10 people, you know, da-da-da-da. And so I began to think about sort of how to make this painting, which was going to go in one direction with this sort of this, arch this 1950s traditional uh, architect, architectural photograph, move into something that really dealt with people now. And so I like this painting because the little people are, I took a lot of time to make them feel as real as possible, to make them individual as, as, as possible, and to remove the individuality of the sort of architectural figure at the top. But it, ultimately, it's this architectural figure who's kind of like, who plays God with these little people. You know, this, it's the chance that's happening. The odds are that you go inside, the odds are you don't go inside. So there's mm -hmm. playing the idea of playing yeah. with statistical chance. So that's kind of what I ended up doing with this. As far as the Richter is concerned, I mean, it's really hard not to be influenced by Gerhard Richter. <laughs> it's really hard because, I mean, he's, in terms of the 20th century uh, post-war figurative artist, I mean, he's probably number one. And then he also has a fantastic abstraction he does. So, yeah, it's very hard not to, to, to begin seeing that, for me as well, to not begin seeing that in the work. Uh, and I think that's okay. You know, I think... Uh, what he managed to introduce into the dialogue of painting is, is relevant and it's one that should be sort of not exploited, but explored. Yeah. These are wonderful close-ups of them, yeah? Yeah. Yes. Okay. The René Magritte always comes to mind also, the veiled, fa the veiled faces and the, yeah, yeah. On the, you know, on social media a lot now also because he has these wrapped heads, right? Just yeah, yeah. And moving in the world, right? Yeah. So here, this is um, a fading room, you call it. This is where you said, oh, the um, no regrets, the previous picture that we saw with this beautiful light and the fancy Correct. lady inside, right? You can see definitely the connection here. But probably most likely known, you know, of uh, where where you studied and all these beautiful mansions that you got to visit in the south of England. I'm wondering if that informed it here. Is it again your paintings also that you see? It's a very intriguing. Um, at first moment, it looks like okay, I understand. You know, you're inside this palace. The closer you look, then you know there's a lot of mysterious. Uh, there, there are mysterious elements like the figures don't all like match. There's the shady kind of figure standing at the at the doorway. I also really like that figure that appears in the frame on the right side. Just is it the reflection of a sculpture? Is it in a painting? Like you can think up all these different uh, scenarios. What is this man in the doorway actually looking at? Like, do you even imagine what's in all these spaces? It's all. There's a lot to imagine again in that space, I feel. Yeah, th this was a, again a large painting. Um, yeah. And this one, when you walk into the gallery, I mean, it's, it's one of those paintings that allows you to go into it. Like if you, I, I feel when I see it, I, I, I want to step into it. And so one of the nice things about this painting was it, it, it happened very quickly and very easily. Uh, and it kind of just let itself be built um, and it was one thing I tried to do at this point was reduce the amount of uh, color I was using. And I thought I would put it in later, kind of do, do, almost do a traditional um, glazing technique to get this painting to work. So it started in black and white and I began building the color into it later. Uh, and I do like the fact that it almost could be a picture postcard of something, but then it undoes itself again. So the figures are not really figures. Right? The paintings are not really paintings. Right. The hallway is probably the most solid structure in in the place, but if you if, if you look at the painting, it really just dissolves, and everything begins to fall apart. And that's one of the things I do like about painting is sort of like the, the fooling it, the, you know, the to fool the percept to fool the perception, so that you question what you're looking at, and maybe you question your own uh, presupposition of of the work. So yeah, but again, you you were right to point out that I have used this this figure on the left. I have used this figure from uh, in the past, but again, this is something I tend to do is I tend to sort of reuse figures and place them and recontextualize them because sometimes they actually just work better 
um, and you know they take a long time to develop these figures. Oh, they're so wonderful! You yes, know? I'm sh yes, I'm sure. But also, once you've created, um, you know, um, imagery in your in your paintings, then they are created and they're kind of alive with you for sure, with us also, right? Then, um, so it makes sense that they reappear. Picasso did that also all the time, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I think I think that's that's one of the cool things about Picasso. He was really good at and he was really good at playing with reinterpretation. And, you know, as a young artist, he was somebody who definitely influenced, as many artists, he definitely influenced me. Uh, and I think one of the nice things about what the Cubists did and then the people that followed Cubism did was they found a way to sort of make a great, a great plastic interpretation of form. Yes. And, and while, while maintaining the idea of space, even if they break down the space from its perspective um, system, from the natural way of looking at things, they they kept the space in there, and then what you end up having by the 1950s and, and 1960s in painting is a complete reduction of space, where the the painting itself the, is the object, right? It's and and I think that mm -hmm. there's a lot of wonderful ways to play with the painting if you treat it as an abstract composition, but allow for space to be the visual perceptual space to be put in back into it. And I think a lot of artists do that. I think, you know, Kerry James Marshall, who the American artist, Kerry James Marshall, does it beautifully. He uses these sort of flat yeah. Matisse like planes, but at the same time there's so much space in in his paintings, you know, and he's and he's really just talking about what he sees around him. So he's an artist that I think introduces space. And I think I I'm trying to do something similar like to what he's doing. Yes, but I think this, like Harry, James Marshall, also this. I um, think people are craving figure, figurative paintings definitely after a long haul of where the focus was always on abstraction. And even like a museum collections, I can see all of this is unpacked again, even from the past. You know, like all these figurative works that were, you know, disregarded a little bit more because, you know, abstraction was so mega important. And, and now you see so much more figurative work again, you know. At, and or with combination of abstraction so you're falling right into that for sure important to bring back hmm. yeah i think that's i think that's true i think but I, and i also think that the the drive the the ideological drive towards sort of pure abstraction that was kind of prevalent in the 50s 60s and 70s you know with the the greenberg the greenbergian school and and the, the reactionaries um that's gone i mean yeah. you know we have we have a much more politicized art world now which is really about sort of like the identity politic. And that's something that I think really relevant artists are exploring. Uh, but in some ways that's kind of left a, a nice space for painters to, to just paint what they want to paint and not have to be stuck in sort of like an ideological war of, you know, are you a minimalist? Are you a, you know, a materialist? You know, you can do what you want to do. Uh, and, and I do think, how can we not want to talk about it? We're actually pretty interested. Even though we're so stupid as human beings, we are our little our little follies are actually very very interesting. You know, totally, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah, artists are, are great thinkers, and so we need to hear what they have to say. I you think, know, yeah, hopefully, yeah. hopefully yeah. that's why we're here with Tim Kent. Yeah. <laughs> hey. yeah. Let's see the next one. I find I think yeah, this is the this is a most intriguing work for me. To me, like there's uh, a lot of background, a lot of story, like very concrete story. Um, because you started with a with a photograph of the Louvre, right? And during World War II, of uh, artworks being uh, evacuated for, uh, from the grain galleries, and so we see here this chaos of frames, you know, um, frames on the street, uh, 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 in in the galleries on the floor, but then also some sculptural work. And here you chose from uh, what you said, this, the figure of the dying goal, right? But he definitely. Like to me, he draws me so much. He has the color. He's, um, he's, you know, he's turning. He's on the on the ground, turning around. There we can see actually also. This is a, on the right side an image of you creating this painting where it's still taped up, right? There's um, taped up and covered up. But so this figure de definitely draws me in. It seems very much alive. It also um makes you with together with this title of ambush you feel like there's something happening right now there's something very destructive and um or you know 
or like a fighting scene maybe it also drew my mind towards syria and what we have going on right now in the world you know this fear about our cultural heritage just you know in lebanon i think there was a lot of artwork lost as well during this uh, explosion so this yeah, there was. stands out to me it's a very it's more of a political work to me maybe yeah i mean i think again this outside uh, what's i called that uh, the fading room was the one piece i did before was the first piece i'd finished by the time i started doing the rest of the works for the show we were deep in we were deep in sort of a uh, uh, crisis mode here right uh, and so a lot of the imagery that i began to use have to has to deal with some sort of anxiety uh, and of course there is the there is references to uh, the artworks being the symbols of cultural heritage and then either you protect them or you destroy them and artworks are always used politically anyway because i mean if you think about you know these famous uh, buddhist statues that the the in the uh, early 2000s the taliban went and destroyed uh, or you look at what was happening in syria with the isis raiders as they went as they went across destroying cities old uh, ancient cities or museums or then you think about today i mean it, within the us itself it's it's like we have so little we in this country we pay so little attention to cultural production for capital gain yeah that it's yeah. the same story it's just a different type of violence imposed upon uh, upon the works and again you know when you have such fantastic imagery coming out of uh, archives such as the the Louvre putting all these pieces away or hiding them away um, how can you not want to use these these imagery and bring them in I, I as soon as I see them I think it's a movie and it has to be somehow sort of like yeah. made into a work in which I get to be part of it somehow uh, and so that's part, the, there's part of that to it and then again the dying gold it's it was it was going to become too academic if I just kind of painted the figure itself. And so I figured it needed to break out of itself. And I kind of thought about it almost like an, the dying gull is breaking out of an eggshell of sorts. So you get this weird, you know, muscular thing appearing in it. So that's kind of where I, I, I kind of took the idea from. Yeah. And it just seemed it worked really well in this space. So. Yes, it's an intriguing space. Here we are, we enjoy space. In the windowless environment, yeah, the master at work. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm taping up the works as you can see. Here. This is this is stenciling, um, or because I, it's it's easy to sort of use a stencil, obviously mixing paint. Um, It's a very reduced palette, so it's great before I start putting colors onto them. And what I tend to do is I build, I build in sort of very flat geometric shapes, and then I'll begin to open up my, uh, open up the strokes and begin playing with the surface of it. And I think that's what you see out there. Pretty. Uh, and that's a day's work done. Whew. Call it a day. Quite funny to watch it. It's amazing. It's like a genius at work, right? And so, th so this will be a day's work, and then the next day I'll go and I'll see what I can adjust, adjust, adjust with that. And then this, is the, this is the designing the piece that I, I put in the show. I think you might have an image of it. Yes, that's the new one, right? The new one that's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oops. Yeah. Oops, sorry. There we go. Yes. Yes, this Ancient. definitely stands out as well. This, this, it's right, kind of like you walk into the gallery and it ca catches your attention for sure. It's more a romantic work at first, I find. When you look at it, it made me think of Cinderella, you know, sweeping the floors here. There's, um, you know, like this tradition, traditional mansion maybe that, uh, that you look at it, but then looking closer, you understand also, wait a second, that same figure appears four times right because she's also there by the fireplace and then she's maybe twice 
in the in the back of it right so there's a repetition that makes it mis makes it mysterious and then you're calling it agent right which also adds a whole other level of uh, mystery and tension to it well we this, this painting started off initially i wanted just to make a very simple uh, study of a room but i knew it had to have something happen to it somehow um and it was this beautiful sort of overly ornate and as someone said it's rather cold interior and i was like yeah that is what it is and then i thought it needs something that i wouldn't expect to see in a space like this normally um, and i found this wonderful photograph of a um a sharecropper in the 1930s and a sharecropper is a somebody who lived on a sharecrop farm during the great depression and they would you know work together and she lived in this tiny little house with you know rough wood floors and flat wood uh, walls and she's scrubbing she's on her hands and knees scrubbing and she's this very powerful person and uh and i thought this is this is this poor woman doing this thing i thought she'd be perfect for this painting so she, I can, she needs to get in there somehow so i i began to use her and i was like well what happens if she's actually painting out the painting she's actually cleaning the painting away so I thought of her as someone, as an agent who scrubbed away, you know, the painting itself. And so I kind of want, and I'm not sure if it, if it works so well, but I kind of wanted to get the idea of you had a team that was moving through systematically cleaning and systematically removing the, undoing the painting from the inside. So that's kind of the idea behind how this image came about. Yeah, you definitely can see her um, whitening the chair, right, that she's left sure. the, um, on the left side. What would intriguing to me also, because definitely in most of your works, you notice the grid structure, right? Like the lines that created like this imaginary grid. And then here, this is missing in a way. But then I realized like all these frames that you, the way you built, you know, you structure the walls and there's, you know, more the detailing or their frames, but you almost can extend those and then come to the same grid, like uh, in, you know, like that, runs through the air also it feels like it's still there just like in a more traditional way maybe yeah i think i i don't i mean i only like to exploit the um you know the, the geometry the perspective when there's a time to do it and here they didn't need, i mean the painting worked yes it, and it, 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 i didn't need to force it i didn't need to force anything into it no because it's there anyway like you can just just these frames are enough so that you can yeah you know, sense it. yeah mm -hmm. i think it's so wonderfully mysterious how she appears several times Definitely. i like that too yeah. it uh, yeah. just keeps you asking questions or like wondering like how what it's yeah that sense of mysticism is what i love so i love the little one at the at the back at the back of the at the back door and she's just kind of moving into the light right she yeah. was my favorite yeah. okay <laughs> the light in general is very cool does she have a name no okay All right. agent three <laughs> okay, we move on. <laughs> yeah. Okay, appeal. Yeah. Here, definitely, I was thinking of the erasing here because these figures, um, again, in this very elegant interior and they're standing together, not sitting together like your grouping that we've mentioned, that we saw before. But then there is this geometry that make me think of kites more. They have kind of like the shape of the old-fashioned kite. But then you can think of them moving up flying up but you could also think of them falling down through this opening but you can definitely also think of them as erasers because somehow like they go over these figures that seem to be taking them out maybe some somehow also and are they ghosts here are they actually present it's a very mysterious presence that they have in this otherwise such so clear and dignified kind of space these uh, okay so the, the show is called the enfilade and obviously if we look down the the left side of the canvas you have this uh you have this view down the hall and that's the enfilade the, this this term but the other term the other use of the term is uh enfilade is a is a volley of bullets for, uh, over an organized volley of bullets from one side to the other side of a, of a battlefield so the idea of sort of organized uh numerics statistics yeah. again comes into this and I like the idea of all these all these figures being organized in rows, and then I and I also like the idea of them standing next to the enfilade. So there's two enfilades that are happening, and then I also thought, you know, 
the painting is very organized and it could be very quiet, but there needs to be some sort of noise into this to disrupt the, the organization of it. And I, uh, and I thought one way of doing that was by breaking the, the lie of the perspective. Because the, by creating this sort of perceptual space, there must be a way to break it. And I thought, well, it's easy if you simply impose flat, obscure shapes on top of this thing coming out of the surface itself. So in the middle, there's this sort of triangular shape with, this, with these sort of white lines coming out of it. That's actually, to me, it's, looks like it's coming right out of the wall. And so I wanted yeah. to impose a third layer onto this thing that did not, that undid the reading of the space as it was. And that's why we, I, I had this event happening. And I've had people interpret it in many different ways. And each time it's, okay, you can interpret it the way you want to. For me, it was, for me, it was a formalist issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but still, yeah. Here they can see it more closer. Yeah. Yeah, this, I, I think this is a good detail. Yes, because you're right. It really seems to be coming out of the wall and just like opening that space up. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And how you manage to create these depths of the hallways is just amazing. Mm -hmm. And here we go to wow. Envoy. Yes, this is the painting that we just saw. You mixing the color, right, and taping it, and and yeah, and doing the first the first day's work of it, right. So here, yeah, this is. How long a process is it approximately from what we saw to this? I know that you work on multiple paintings at the same time, but the intricacy and the, the amount of thought and work in these paintings lead me to believe that it takes a long time. Can you share a, a little bit with that? I, yeah, I mean, for me, making a painting is a is an involved process and I've always tried to remove um, the amount of work I have to do which doesn't really work when I start a painting I I stick with it and I work with it and I do as much work as I can on it till I can't work on it anymore uh, for that day and then I'll, I'll, I'll rest and then I'll stay with a painting as long as it needs to be as long as it needs work of some sort so usually I do about a 12 hour day if, we're, if you're thinking about sort of in terms of how many hours a day, um, and it's pretty much five, uh, six to seven days a week. Uh, if I can take a break, I usually take a break when I don't have any ideas or any plans. So now I'm finally having a, a couple of weeks off, but it's uh, to take advantage of the summer before we go into the winter. Um, and it's uh, yeah, it's a. Uh, I'll just sit with them till they're done, and they. I just want people to know what an enormous effort it is to create such pieces. As yeah, I don't have a life. The determination. No and that's what you mean. <laughs> but that is a very, I mean, it's a gift to be, you know, to have these, to be creative and to be able to create like these uh, wonderful paintings. That is quite a life to have. <laughs> I'm yeah. lucky, for yeah. sure. And yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm very fortunate. Yeah. And, and it, yeah, and it shows all around of uh, what you're giving us. And here, the, the final defilade. Yes, that is definitely a striking painting. It's also one of the larger ones in the exhibition. And this yellow, uh, this yellow huge brush, brush stroke here that disrupts the scene is quite intense. It's not so, so you have it also reminds of a previous painting that we saw, right? The, in, the, the interior space with, the, uh, with this office table and a grouping of what looks mostly like men. Um, beautiful is maybe the same space that you were the photograph that you would that you were thinking thinking about so you have the the line drawings but also windows coming in you know soft light falling onto a finished wall and then this brush job that I don't know is it hair you know now we have orange hair on our mind going into the fireplace or is it like a fire you know tongue jet, jutting jetting out of it um, the guy's yeah, spirit is leaving or arriving. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I get you're right. I mean, this is this is definitely the room, one of these rooms that I love to use over and over again. I mean, it, it's the gift that keeps on giving because, I, I mean, I, I can pretty much paint this out of my head happily. Um, 
and I keep finding ways to use this space as a as a launching pad for um, different scenarios. I had, it was very very light painting originally, and as I began finishing it, I I found that the the windows needed to become more dominant, and I wanted to play up this sort of this sort of strange square pattern happening in the background, this rectangular pattern that's happening in the background. Yeah. And then finally I was like, well, it's so odd to have all these people looking at each other. How can we kind of, how can I remove them from the space? And I thought about this man's face is kind of like, kind of firing away. And then there was a big uh, fireplace and I was like, well, it has to go somewhere. So let's just put it up the fireplace. So, so he's kind of wiping this sort of thing away. And again, this also happens at, have, is happening concurrently as I'm making this painting concurrently with sort of the Black Lives Matters movement. I'm thinking about like, you know, what is some of the imagery that could be applied to this at this point? Mm -hmm. You know, wiping away the sort of like structure or this hierarchy possibly. Yes, this is a wonderful close up. It's also fascinating to see how you create this, uh, this space and to see how, you know, when you step a few steps away, you can have almost like a, a photographic imagery of this reflecting table, right? That reflects the, uh, the back of the room. And then to step forward and to see, you know, how painterly it actually is. Like the whole spatial uh, depiction is just so wonderful here. Thank you. Yeah, definitely brings about, I don't know, I haven't mentioned, but Giacometti, I think, comes to mind for many Europeans probably, you know, like especially looking at your, looking at your work, you know, the, um, here, it, it especially to me, like the, the the space and the lines, Giacometti and Francis Bacon, these you know close friends. I don't know, was Bacon on your mind studying in England at that time? He was like one of the one the one of the major artists remaining to be figurative, right? When everything turned so abstract. And yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's the the modern the, the sort of post war modern masters european masters were really influential on me i mean like there was a show in 2001 i think right after 9 11 that was or 2002 which was giacometti at the moma yeah when I, when I saw that it completely transformed everything for me and uh, and and then at that at the same time there was the he, they had all the paintings that he was making they had yeah. two rooms of his sort of portraits and I, had, I was working on sort of these geometric compositions at the time and I saw in his work a way of dealing with the linear as a, as a descriptive uh, gestural way of describing space. Mm -hmm. And then of course Bacon is all over the place because what he does is he's not a... He offers an alternative to the way in which the figure can be presented. Yeah. In New York City, we have a very traditionalist school of figurative painting, or we have a very sort of self-taught, autodidactic school of figurative painting. And I think Bacon bridges the gap between the sort of early modern period into the sort of um, identity politic period. And so he's somebody who, when I first saw him, and I'm sure most young artists, when they see Francis Bacon, are riveted by his depth and power. Uh, yeah. And he's somebody who, you know, no matter what I do figuratively, he'll always come out in it because he's just so, he, he influenced me so much early on as a way of thinking about how to present an emotional state, how to create a figure in a modern st in a modern sense a non-academic sense mm -hmm. and also somebody who was not afraid to really say what he to express how he felt and that's something i think few artists including myself can really do well as well as he did mm -hmm. yes you share the mood is similar here we see this painting in the making in your in your yeah. studio and the yeah. interior on the on the right side as well. The yeah. interior scene. Yeah. Oh, and we see this beautiful uh, power structure there on your shelf, right? The uh, electric tower. 
pylons. Exactly. The pylons, pylon, yes. Up on top, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can't get enough yeah. of those pylons. I see pylons. I see. I see, I think Tim can. So. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Here we, we're coming to the end of the show. Here. Yeah. This is yeah. it. Yeah. Finishing the show. <laughs> The master yeah, is so thinking or resting or creating the next masterpiece. Right, yeah. So, you know, it's the last couple of days before a show, I'm always in the studio. Uh, and I don't really sleep a lot, so. Yeah, I took a, this I, is a great I, I think, shot. This is a wonderful shot. Thank you. Yes, also to understand that it takes this digest, time of digestion, right? Like thinking yeah. about letting it mature. Mm-hmm. And here we see them uh, in the gallery, just a couple of shots of that. Yeah, it's a beautiful space. The beautiful space and the sheer size of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that and agent. Yeah. Okay, ladies, gentlemen. Yes, congratulations to congratulations. Mr. Wonderful yeah. show. Yeah. So we're good to thank you very much. Thank you for Thank you for sharing all your insights. And congratulations to your success. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you. We'll talk soon. Bye. 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 <laughs>